Have your ready is three. I'd like to call this regular meeting of our entire town council for order. Today is Monday, January the 23rd, 6.30 p.m. We have roll call, please. Councilor, Councilor Deneau. Here. Councilor Cooper. Here. Councilor Toner. Here. Councilor Burnett. Councilor Grinstead. Here. County Councilor Lynch. Here. And Mayor Lee. Here. And I would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we work and gather is the traditional unceded territory of the Anishinaabe people. Just got a pop up, pardon me. Uh, this Algonquin nation has lived on this land for thousands of years, long before the arrival of European settlers, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to be present in this territory. We have the adop adoption of the agenda, please. We resolve the agenda for the regular meeting of council dated Monday, January 23rd, 2023, be adopted. We were in second, please. Councilor Cooper and Councilor Lynch. Uh, any additions, deletions? None. All in favor? Thank you. Any disclosures of pecuniary interest? None. Um, any questions on previous council business or minutes? No. And can we have the adoption of minutes of previous meetings, please? Set the minutes of the regular meeting of council listed under item 7A on the agenda be adopted. I move in a second, please. Councillor Toner, Councillor Grinstead. And all in favor? Great. Um, no awards, delegations, uh, presentations. Um, no public meetings. Matters table preferred, unfinished business, we have none. And moving into, we've got a busy night tonight. Um, this one I'm really looking forward to. We, yeah, the staff report, we lost transit. The council received report 23-01-23-01 as information. Move in a second, please. Councilor Cooper, County Councilor Lynch. And my understanding is that Deanna is good, so we have I mean, excuse me, I'm filling in. Yes, unfortunately, Deanna is ill today and uh, couldn't be here tonight. So I'm going to walk us through this presentation. Um, so it is a pretty lengthy presentation. Presentation, I'm going to warn you right now. And as you can see, it's on a, a CIF um, template format letterhead, if you will, uh, continuous improvement fund. So this is a template that they provided to uh, all municipalities across Ontario to use as a as a tool to educate and inform public council uh, and the like. So there's there's a little bit of repetition throughout. I'm gonna run through the slide fairly quickly. Um, some of it is a bit of a background or some of the history that uh, sort of how we got here. Um, but at any time, if, if uh, council has any questions or you wanna stop me on something, uh, feel free to raise your hand and then we can uh, take a closer look at it. Um, but with that, I will dive right in. So a brief outline of what we're going to cover here this evening, uh, the producer responsibility, the legislative framework, <coughs> the current versus future, so that's the mainly the responsibilities, um, the key concepts and terms, the decisions for council to make, the eligible sources uh, of blue block material, the non-eligible sources of blue box material, uh, the service standard that will have been set previously and will be set, uh, the designated materials, what actually goes into the blue box, the targets, uh, previous set and future set in the new regulation, uh, as well as the timelines uh, moving forward. So, what is producer responsibility? Producer responsibility is a regulatory approach to waste management where producers, companies that make and import the products, are responsible for the waste generated from their products and packaging. In Ontario, the Blue Box program is transitioning from a model of shared industry funding to one of full producer responsibility where producers are operationally and financially responsible. So a little image here, uh, Council has seen this in the past uh, during some of the um, orientation information. On the left-hand side, essentially what you have is uh, the producers uh, at the top who are creating the products, the recycled products, they are contributing 50% funding to the local governments, being municipalities, uh, who are ultimately running the program of recycling. Uh, the, sorry, producers send the products out to the uh, residential consumers. Uh, the consumers then use the product and recycle the, uh, the waste product, being recyclable. 
and then the local government takes over and actually runs the recycling program, funded 50% by the producers and 50% by uh, the users, the municipality. So what we're moving to is a model where the producers will produce the product, it'll go out to the residential consumers and market, uh, the waste will be, will be developed or will be um, created, and the producers will then take over and actually manage the recycling program themselves uh, and fully fund it as well. So some of the legislative framework, uh, several acts and regulations um, which have governed the uh, recycling program in Ontario for a number of years, uh, dating back to uh, 1994 when the initial act, the Environment Protection Act, uh, implemented the Ontario Regulation 101 and 94, which essentially was uh, when recycling, blue box recycling uh, took effect and was required in the province of Ontario. Uh, several other regulations uh, throughout the years uh, and then fast forward to today, we have our new Ontario Regulation 391-21, uh, which is outlining the new requirements for the whole producer responsibility. Uh, again, this is a similar image that kind of depicts the same. So uh, moving from the left to the right, you have uh, the Ontario Regulation 101-94, uh, which set the requirement for uh, blue box recycling in Ontario. If you full municipal responsibility at the time, um, you probably took on the full responsibility. Then moving into uh, 2003, the um, Blue Box uh, Production Plan uh, Act and requirements um, outlined the shared responsibility, which um, essentially put 50% of the, the funding requirements on the producers to fund. And then fast forward to today, we move into the full producer responsibility uh, as the yeah, regulations outline. So, current versus future, these are roles and responsibilities. Again, another image um, to help illustrate on the left-hand side, you can see you have the producers at the top. Um, they contribute um, fees to an organization called Stewardship Ontario, who essentially um, determines uh, the requirements for the Blue Box program. Uh, the municipalities and, and First Nation communities run the program. We then report each year through data call to the regulatory authority or RPRA, uh, which then determines the amount of funding that the producers are responsible to contribute towards the program each year. Uh, and then down below, municipalities uh, run the service, uh, manage the contracts with the waste management contractors, uh, take care of everything from promotion and education to getting the actual product to the recycling facilities. Um, moving forward in the post-transition uh, era, we now have uh, a different situation where the producers uh, are creating products. They are working with what they call a pro uh, producer responsibility organization, which we'll speak to a little bit further uh, in the slide. Um, and then these, uh, these pros actually manage the service contracts as opposed to municipalities. Um, and they report directly to RPRA as far as the amount of recyclables that are generated through the province. Uh, this essentially uh, is the same uh, information just depicted in a table format. So it won't go through it all, but as you can see, it has responsibilities on the left hand side, operational, financial, and reporting requirements. The second column being the uh, pre transition requirements, mostly being shared between the producer and the uh, municipalities or local governments, and then on the right hand side, the future post transition uh, producer responsibilities. Some of the key concepts and terms, uh, just for information, eligible community is essentially uh, a local municipality or local service board area that is located in the far north uh, of Ontario, of Ontario rather, uh, or a reserve that is located. Um, uh, not located in far north and is registered by a First Nation with the authority. So far north is essentially anything north of uh, Timmins or Thunder Bay is what they've determined to be far north. So everything south of that is included within the eligible communities. And the eligible sources on the right hand side are essentially uh, the property types which create the waste or the recyclable materials. Um, anything from a residential property, apartment building, uh, multi-unit residential apartment building. Uh, and again, we'll get into some of the more detail of what those eligible sources are, but that just helps to illustrate what the term eligible source 
uh, refers to. Transition period versus uh, post transition. So the transition period is essentially from July 1st of this year till, till the, uh, the end of 2025. Producers will assume operational and fiscal responsibility for all eligible communities throughout the transition period on dates provided by the ministry. The producers will be responsible for communications, replacing blue boxes, and dealing with complaints, concerns from the residents. And eligible communities can choose to negotiate with a pro to continue service delivery or fully divest their responsibility. So in this case, we have fully divested our responsibility. Um, generally speaking, the municipalities uh, who have more of an interest in uh, working with uh, the pro to actually provide some of the service and act as a contractor are more municipalities, most of the larger municipalities who have assets, have their trucks, have facilities um, that have a vested interest in continuing to keep those assets uh, operating. So in, in our first case, we, we do not own those assets and we contract the service out. Uh, so it made sense for us to divest that responsibility to the producers uh, and their pros. So post-transition, January 1st, 2026, and thereafter, the producers will be fully responsible uh, for operating and financing the Blue Box program in all Ontario municipalities. Producers will be responsible for communications, replacing blue boxes and dealing with complaints, uh, concerns similar to during the transition period. Uh, and the producers will have increased responsibilities and targets as set out in the new Ontario regulation. Uh, with respect to each individual type of recycled material. And eligible communities could choose to negotiate with a coach, continue to service delivery, or fully divest. Again, moving forward, uh, there is the option to first municipalities who have a vested interest to continue uh, working as a, as a contractor, essentially. Um, so producers versus, versus the pros, what's the difference? The producers are essentially the brand holders importers and retailers of the products. So the big box, the big companies that, that generate the material, grocery store, food packaging, there's a long list here, retail stores, fast food packaging, the list kind of goes on. And then the, the pros are essentially the blue box. Um, they're, they're essentially a consultant, if you will, that's working on behalf of these producers. Um, they represent a number of producers that and then sort of undertake and <clears throat> and uh, lead the responsibilities that the producers have under the regulation. So again, it's kind of like a, like a consultant, if you will. Um, producers may collaborate to meet their requirements and responsibilities in the new regulation under the PRO, and each producer decides which PRO to join. Um, in our case, uh, in Ontario, one of the biggest ones, uh, the biggest uh, PRO is circular materials. They represent a long list of large uh, producers. There's, a, there's an image on the screen with a, a number of the, the big players that produce a lot of recycled materials each year. Um, so circular materials is essentially who we are dealing with uh, in Ontario. Uh, a few different um, pros that they list. Again, we're really only concerned about circular materials. At this point, they are the ones that have been uh, designated required uh, being required for the collection system in Ontario. A couple of others there, uh, and we'll note later on the Canadian Beverage Container Recycling Association, uh, which we don't have a lot of involvement or, or knowledge of at this point, but we are aware that they are working uh, at potentially considering um, a system where they would uh, assist with some of the collection of recyclables at community facilities, arenas, and, and that. That like so we're waiting for more information on that uh, to follow in the future, but uh, those are the history of the, the larger pros in Ontario. So circular materials Ontario or CMO as we refer to them, uh, major majority pro in Ontario circular materials is responsible for the common collection system, which is essentially the term they've used for collecting recyclables from the curbside, transporting them to the recycling facility. Uh, that process is, is referred to the common collection system. Uh, they will procure and award agreements for collection and consolidation of blue, blue box materials. Uh, they're working with a company called Reverse Logistics Group uh, to manage some of their group agreements with contractors and the like and, um, and the processing facilities. And eligible communities must share critical details about their eligible sources prior to transition. So we continue to do that. We've had deadlines in the last couple of years that so we need to report certain pieces of information as far as number of users, tonnages that we generate in the community, which 
uh, we've continued to do over the last couple of years. <clears throat> Uh, the common collection system again this is just really an image to depict uh, what exactly it is showing the collection blue boxes uh, at the curb and then transporting them to a receiving facility uh, this image again is really just an image to help visualize um, how it's sort of going to look and how it's going to work in ontario you can see uh, over top of, a, of an image of, of the majority of ontario there you've got um, your big MERS here uh, municipal recycling facilities and you you've got your smaller receiving facilities that will be scattered throughout the province uh, strategically by circular materials and then ultimately the, the product will be transferred from the curbside to the recycling facility ultimately to the larger merge for processing facility uh, decisions for council so this is a uh, one of interest um, for this group particularly um, Consider providing service. Eligible communities can consider providing services at one or multiple points in the system. Uh, as the majority pro certain materials Ontario with uh, with reverse logistics group are currently working to procure services uh, in a non-competitive process. Eligible communities may accept a contract offer to provide services during the transition period, or in a separate competitive process, eligible communities may submit proposals to provide services during and beyond transition. Again. Um, we're past this point already. We've elected not to uh, provide the service as a, essentially as a contractor. It's really just to educate and, and give a bit more background on uh, what the options were to some municipalities uh, and to inform you that, uh, that Circular Materials Ontario are still continuing to work through those service agreements uh, with some of those uh, communities who have opted in. Uh, again, with respect to the opt-in versus opt-out um, during the transition period, communities may opt-in providing services by accepting a master services agreement statement of work. Um, there was some templates that were circulated about a year ago, um, and they really weren't of something that the municipality was interested in. Again, primarily because we don't have the assets, uh, it made more sense for us to, to divest that to uh, pros and let them work with the contractors who are, who are in the business. Uh, and again, this is really just speaking to the same topic, so I won't get into it in too much detail. Um, summary of CMO procurement processes. Uh, so they're currently working to, pro to provide uh, services for the common collection system. Um, so basically they're working uh, with contractors right now. They have, we do understand they have secured a, a number of agreements with collection contractors for uh, some area municipalities throughout the province, um, they are still working with some of those collection contractors, Armbar being one, uh, to confirm and, and firm up an agreement. Uh, there are some other municipalities we're aware of in the general area that are still waiting on confirmation from CMO uh, as far as who their collection contractor will be. Uh, but that's really still the period that they're at. We were expecting to have that buttoned up by now, but um, unfortunately, we continue to. Uh, to wait on CMO to provide that confirmation. So, um, moving ahead into eligible sources. So, again, sources being the location that the recycled materials are being collected from. On the left hand side, you can see um, the pre transition. So, where we're at today, uh, the three colored images would represent your single family homes, uh, <coughs> your seasonal dwellings, and your multi residential dwellings. Uh, they are all part of the program currently. For local municipalities with a population of 5,000 or more. And then the, uh, the three grayed out images would, would indicate or represent the industrial, commercial, institutional ICI. So while we do collect from a number of our ICI um, locations in Armfire, the 50% funding that is currently provided by Stewardship Ontario or the producer it does not cover uh, the cost for the ICI collection. So there is an exercise of subtracting that, and we do our reporting each year, and we do not receive funding. Uh, for that portion of the collection program. Moving ahead into the post-transition program, um, similarly, uh, the same type of residential dwellings will be included. They've also elected to include public and private schools, specified retirement long-term care homes, and public space collection, which we'll speak to a bit more detail as well. Uh, eligible sources, so again, a transition date uh, to December 31st, 2025. 
for to maintain servicing as of August 15th. So essentially they use that date as the cutoff for, for what the municipality was providing, what type of service and who we were collecting from. So they're going to maintain that service plus any new uh, new developments that, that would come on in the town through the subdivisions and the like. Um, so if there were municipal, if there were uh, users, ICI, that sort of thing, uh, or other users that were part of the program as of August 15th, they'll continue to uh, allow them to be part of the program. But moving forward, uh, January 1st, 2026, uh, the pros to extend the collection to all non service communities outside of our work and non service eligible sources if registered. Uh, moving along, so specifically on the eligible sources, uh, the specified retirement and long term care homes include retirement homes, long term care homes that are either operated by a municipality. Uh, not for profit or included in the Waste Diversion Transition Act Blue Box program as of the August 15th, 2019 deadline. Uh, specified public spaces. So, pre transition uh, Blue Box materials are, will be collected or have been collected uh, in our program based on what we what we have for locations. So we have approximately 45 locations, primarily in our downtown core along the, uh, along the streetscape. Uh, that are part of our collection program now. So those will be continued to be collected through the transition period from now, or from July of 2023 to the end of 2025. Um, so they will honor those collection locations. But moving forward, the full transition, post transition, January 2026, they've come up with this calculation on the right hand side in the, in the table uh, that basically calculates how many locations they will collect. So that's what it says right now. Uh, essentially what it equates to for our loosely if you run the math on our population of 10,000 um, divided by 800, it really results in about 12 locations. So uh, we're kind of missing out there. We're hopeful that uh, as the, the fine details of the regulation uh, get sort of worked out and, and some of these these details get ironed out over the course of a couple of years, we're hopeful that maybe they'll uh, include the remainder of our uh, public space collection locations, but as it stands right now, that's really the way it's written, and that's all they'll be responsible for or required to collect. So we will have to figure out a plan as to how we're going to continue to collect the remainder of those, whether it's um, within, like in-house services or in-house staffing, or whether we work it into a collection contract uh, with a with an outside contractor. So it's one detail that uh, we don't want to lose sight of. Public spaces, uh, pros, so circuit materials, be responsible for public space collection as outlined in reg, uh, and as I noted, Canadian Beverage Container Recycling Association are apparently investigating opportunities to collect beverage containers in other public settings, such as arenas, libraries, and all stadiums. So I don't have much more detail on that uh, specifically, but we'll continue to uh, look at it those updated. Uh, Non-eligible sources. So essentially on the left hand side, you see what is non eligible as of uh, today. So the 50% funding does not cover the cost of uh, your ICNI. And um, post transition, uh, for the most part, that will continue to be the same. Industrial and commercial properties will not be part of the program, uh, but they've elaborated. So we also note that not for profit organizations, municipal buildings, such as libraries, arenas, Town halls, um, daycare, place to worship um, will not be included as well. So we've been a little bit more specific on uh, what will and will not be included. Uh, this image really just helps to kind of visualize um, the fact that in a, in a downtown core, for example, uh, the, per, the top image represents um, a typical downtown where you would have a retail business on the bottom and residential apartments on the top. Um, so really what it's showing is that the apartment buildings above will be eligible and will be collected through uh, the program in the, in the full transition, but the businesses uh, beneath will not be eligible for the program. So there's certainly some questions still floating out there as to how that's going to be managed, how it's going to be policed, for lack of better words. Um, there are questions that definitely are being raised and out there, but um, there's not a whole lot of answers yet as to how that will actually be enforced and managed by CMO. I mean, they're certainly well aware of the, the challenges, I guess I'll say, with, with managing that. Um, but that's really the way the regulation is written, and that's 
far as we know now, the way they fully intend to adhere to the regulation post transition 2026. So we do have this period of time between July 1st of this year to the end of 2025. So the transition period where essentially what, um, what we'll be told is that the pros uh, will be uh, allowing the collection of the residential and the commercial to happen simultaneously and co-collect it, same truck, throw it all in together. But we as a municipality will have to work out an arrangement with the contractor who the pro is using and, and compensate them however that looks, whatever that fee may be collected. For the transition period, anyway, it allows us to sort of buy this some time to allow those businesses to continue to have a service. There will be a fee, which we don't have that fee as of yet, um, but it should be a much more economical fee in that it will be collected in the economy of scale of the rest of the residential properties of the town at the same time. Um, Post transition 2026, they are making it fairly clear that the pros want nothing to do with the commercial. The ICI commercial component of it, and they will not allow that to be mixed in the same truck with the contractor. So then we're into a discussion of either procuring a separate contract, potentially the same contractor, but coming in at a different time with a different truck or what have you, just can't be mixed in. And then, of course, you lose some economy to scale, which in theory should increase the price. So that's going to be the, the big discussion that we continue to need to have, but unfortunately, we just don't have all the details. Uh, to have that discussion with the council at this point, uh, particularly the the, uh, the financial component of that. So, uh, moving along, the non-eligible sources. Um, so again, this is pretty much depicting the same thing. Those are not responsible to service these sources. Uh, currently, some non-eligible sources are serviced through residents and blue box program, as we do not covered under the eight percent funding. Um, yeah, it's essentially. Pretty much covered that one too. Um, moving ahead to service standards. Um, so it's, this is just giving a little bit more information on some of the uh, requirements of the new regulation as far as what uh, level of service is required to be provided for the residents. So again, left side of the screen, free transition, uh, the residents uh, who have curbside garbage collection, in which case basically every, everyone in our town um, also will be provided curbside collection for recyclable, and it must be at at least half of what it is for garbage. So if you get garbage collection every week, we have to provide recycling collection at least every second week, essentially. That's the way we are today. If we had, if we were in more of a rural area and we used a depot where we didn't do curbside collection, we just had a depot where people brought their garbage there, uh, we would also have to provide a depot for recycling. We're not really so much in that boat because we provide curbside collection for the town. Post transition, moving forward, um, basically the same residents who have curbside garbage collection, the pros must uh, collect the curbside collection at those locations. And specifically, the curbside collection must be at least every other week. So in our case, it's basically the same thing, but it's it's being a little bit more specific. Uh, in that if we were only collecting recyclables every four weeks right now or something, there is now a requirement that it has to be every other week. So uh, from our point of view, nothing should really change because that is essentially the service that we provide to our residents. Uh, sort of standard mm -hmm. residents transition date, um, essentially saying the same thing, post collect curbside from all residents uh, receive curbside as of August 15th, with the same increase or increased frequency. Um, so they'll continue to provide the service as we do for the trench period and then moving forward, um, they'll have to uh, provide only people collection to residents or curb, or they can opt to provide curbside. So again, it doesn't really impact us because we already provide curbside. Uh, facilities and public spaces. Um, so pre-transition right now, uh, the current regulation for the the old reg 10194 does not specify collection of blue box materials from facilities or public spaces. So it's not really required in the reg other than multi residential buildings. Um, moving forward, the new regulation will require pros um, to provide receptacles to all of those locations the multi res, um, the uh, retirement homes, and the 
public spaces. And another point to make from the regulation is that they're required to actually provide the, the type of receptacle that suits the property. So there's kind of an image there. You've got everything from a, a blue box to a large toll on wheels to sort of a, a large dumpster side. And there's a requirement that they must uh, provide uh, a sufficient and ample type of receptacle for the size of the of the location based on how much material they generate. Uh, moving along to designated materials, the on left hand side, what we, it's currently required. So you can see at the top, um, all of those requirements or all those materials uh, sort of highlighted in the blue line for, for the beverages and the newsprint are required. And then there's only a requirement for at least two of the remainder to be included in a municipal collection system. Uh, every municipal collection system is slightly different throughout the province of Ontario. But now what we're going to do is essentially try to bring that all together and make it the same across the province. So they're looking for consistency. Uh, and they're expanding the number of the type of products that will be included in uh, the collection stream. And you can see that on the right-hand side, there's a number of different products there that will be required to be collected. This image really just uh, assigns a category to each type of material. This image really just is a visual representation showing how on the left-hand side currently, we kind of have a mixed match um, Collection system in the English quality, and when we move to the new system, it will be consistent across the entire province. Uh, designated materials. So essentially, um, what it's saying is materials that were collected with the blue box, um, but not designated under the waste diversion transition program, will, will not be required to be collected. So if your program by chance collects things like pots and pans and books, uh, which ours does not. Um, they will not be required to continue to collect that just because we did. Uh, and moving forward in the January 1st, 2026 full transition, pros must collect except all designated materials under the new reg, but may stop collecting items not designated. Um, so there's uh, essentially any item that we were collecting that was designated through the Waste Diversion Transition Act, um, they would not have to collect that moving forward. So long list there of other materials that they are still excluding, um, but I didn't list them all. So moving forward with targets. Um, so as it stands right now, the regulation does not have a specific um, target for the percentage of materials recovered through recycling. Apparently, there was an announcement in 2003 by the government of the day that stated that the target was 60% uh, recovery of blue box materials by 2008. So moving forward, the new regulation has very specific targets. Uh, you can see on the right-hand side in the light gray shaded uh, for each category, basically what the province was hitting for percentage of diversion in 2018 for each type of product. And then in comparison, the uh, percentage of diversion targets that they've specified in the reg for 2026 and then 2030 as well. So it incrementally increases uh, as they strive to do better as the program unfolds. This image is fairly basic and really just uh, represents what recovery percentage is. So A divided by B, A being the recovered resources through the program, and B being the total weight of material supplied to consumers in Ontario, uh, divided out and you get the recovery percentage. And lastly, timelines. Um, essentially where we are, you can see uh, in comparison to where the uh, the new blue box regulation was passed on June 3rd of 2021, where we're at today, uh, early 2023. And then uh, where we will be, uh, it's, it's going to speed up quite quickly. As you can see, it's taken a couple of years to get to this point, um, but the transition date is coming very quickly. And then that year and a half um, of, or sorry, two and a half years rather of um, transition period will go by quite quickly as well. Uh, before we hit the uh, full transition on January 1st, 2026. 
uh, as I noted, our incredible will transition on July 29th, 2023, along with a number of our, our neighboring municipalities in the area. Um, the remainder of those dates are, are really not too relevant. There are just requirements for producers, pros, and processors to register over the course of the last couple of years. Uh, this really just speaks to those initial those reports that I spoke to briefly, where over the last couple of years, the municipality has had uh, several reports that we've had to provide uh, with respect to the data that we uh, we currently, the, the amount of uh, recyclables that we currently collect and how many, um, how many residents we collect from. So that has been done. We have met that requirement. Uh, there was a transition report that was due September 30th, 2021 as well, which we did submit uh, in a timely manner. And producer registration, these were the timelines that the producers were responsible to register. Um, interesting note, um, a, municipality, a municipality can be a producer in some cases, um, usually because of printing and distribution of paper, for example, tax bills, um, waste collection calendars, water bills, that type of thing. Um, but the threshold that they've set, uh, I don't have the full knowledge as to how they've set the threshold, but um, they came up with a set threshold of nine, nine tons of paper um, generated per year. So we don't hit that anywhere near. We run some rough estimates and less than a ton anyway. So uh, it doesn't apply to us, but in some larger municipalities cases, they potentially may be actually seen as a producer as well. So just an interesting bit of information. Um, processor registration, again, timelines for uh, processors to register, not overly relevant uh, in this conversation for us. And then just a quick snapshot of sort of where we stand with respect to some of our um, contracts right now. So March 31st, 2023, our TOPS year six garbage contract ends. We've since extended that contract, uh, which you also see on the, uh, on the image there. March 31st, 2023 is our TOPS uh, year seven garbage collection contract ending. Um, and our Tomlinson uh, landfill contract, so Tomlinson manages the landfill, is actually coming quickly to an end August 31st of this year as well. So we'll be working on a, a tender in the coming months for management of the landfill. Um, so it's a pretty busy time right now for waste management between the uh, blue box transitioning and um, a couple of other waste management contracts set to expire in the coming months uh, and year ahead. So that just gives a quick visual. And lastly, there's a number of um, terms that are there for council's information, definitions, and whatnot throughout. I'm not going to speak to them, but they're, they're there in the resource uh, in the event that council wants to uh, read up because they're on it. So essentially, uh, just jumping out of the presentation, we've got there. There's some uh, there's some resources there as well that are, that's uh, in the package, but. Um, as we noted, uh, as I noted previously, the, the big decision that we're going to need to make is really with respect to our, our ICI customers, the, one that, the ones that have currently opted into our program over the last number of years, uh, particularly in our downtown core. Um, we're well aware that that is um, the biggest decision that we're going to need to make. Uh, we're hopeful uh, that at this point in time, we might have a little bit more information uh, that we maybe have uh, confirmation from CMO that our collection contractor was sort of lock in and secure. Fortunately, we don't. Um, we do have continue to have discussions with uh, TOPS Environmental, who's our current collection contractor, and uh, we're sort of hopeful that they will reach an agreement with CMO to be uh, the collection contractor for the pros. Um, and we'll continue to have uh, discussions with them uh, as, as we can um, with respect to uh, potential costs and, and ability to collect from our ICI customers, particularly in the downtown core. But um, at this point, the report's really just for information. There's, there's no formal decisions that need to be made. Um, sort of a good background and, and bring everyone up to speed, uh, council and the public. Uh, and with that, I'll kind of open it up. And if there are any questions, um, I'd be happy to uh, take them out. John, of the ones who um, have already reported, because you said that some have already reported, are most of them keeping with their current contract? Sorry, some have already the ones that have already um, said who they're going to be staying with are the ones who we're hoping to stay with talks, uh, but we haven't heard back yet. Uh, to my knowledge, in most cases, it, the 
a CMO pro has secured the existing contractors. So in some cases it is tops, to my knowledge. Some municipalities that tops provide service to, they haven't reached an agreement for whatever reason, they haven't reached an agreement for Armfire and a few others. So I guess we're not privy to all the details of those negotiations and discussions, but there's obviously some aspects of those discussions and negotiations that had to be continued to discuss. Um, but yes, um, to, to my knowledge, at least sort of locally, is sort of the lens that we're looking at. Uh, I believe most of the ones that they've secured are the a continuation of the current collection contract, so not switching. And outside of the core, outside of downtown, um, what percentage of our IC9 does downtown represent? That's a good question. I don't have specific percentages. I mean, we can dig into that. Jana would probably run it right off the top of her head if she was here, but um, it's not something that, that I, I have sort of um, just in the back of my mind. So we can pull some of that data and just share it with council for information, maybe by email just for information. But um, it's the majority of it, really. Um, and we can define it as a downtown core, I guess, as well. But really, it's the majority of, of the ICI users are sort of in our, the heart of our downtown. Yeah. Okay, so the, the bigger producers of real estate that have private contractors, then right? That's not. Yes, most of them do. There's there's not very many large producers that generate a, a large volume of recyclable waste. Um, like when you get out to the mall and sort of more your big box type stores, that type of thing, they they pretty much all have private uh, garbage and recycling contractors. So I think it'll be interesting to see how they can combine and separate. The residential downtown from the IC area, what that'll look like. I imagine some of that will also determine how we will be able to split that responsibility as they make that decision. Yeah, it, it will be interesting to see how they, they approach it. So, if we can come to an agreement with Hobbs, let's assume that they become the contractor working for the pro. If we do come to an agreement with them for the transition period to just have those ICI. Locations, I'll, I'll say, kind of piggyback onto the program. Uh, it'll be interesting to see if Pro um, CMO whether they use that transition period to come out and do some level of enforcement or inspection or gather data and try to try to draw that line between you know whose blue box came from the residents and whose came from the the business below. We're not sure yet. Um, they're all great questions and, and certainly they're aware of it. They may have some, some strategies in mind that they just haven't shared with us yet, but uh, yeah, it's, it's going to be a challenge, I think. I don't like the fact that it was a bit of the service side of these <laughs> challenges that, that Maureen deals with on the daily. Thank you, John. With our new Contract coming up in March 23 with the tops or whoever. In the past, we used to get a, a group of uh, the leg, you know, seven municipalities together to get a better price for this stuff. Are we going to be on our own for March 23 because it's going to be over by 2025? Does that make sense? So, the just to clarify, so the March 23 is our garbage collection contract. So, our final year seven, which was an optional year, will start this March and go until March of 2024. And then the recycling program transition period is from July 29th of 2023, two and a half years till the end of 2025. So January 1st, 2026. Do we have a contract today for that amount of time? For garbage collection? No, for the recycle. So that's what we don't have confirmation of yet. We're hopeful to have that very soon. So we know that CMO, the pro, and TOPS, our existing recycling contractor, are in discussion and have been for a while. They just haven't reached an agreement yet, but we're hopeful that they will. So this, again, I go to the past where we tried to get the seven municipalities together to get a better price. For recycling, for garbage, for all the stuff. That's out the window now because the pro 
would be doing individually municipalities, right? Yeah, or the recycling. We, we can still continue to, to approach it. Uh, the, the garbage uh, garbage collection contract, we can still continue to consider that avenue as far as a group tender. That's something that we'll, we'll look at discussing and, and see um, sort of where some of our neighboring municipalities are. There was probably more benefit previously in the recycling component of it because all of us local municipalities, our material was all being transported to the same location. With, I mean, with the garbage, we all kind of have our individual landfills, so we operate a little bit more on our own. I mean, there's still some economy in the scale, I suppose, if the contractor is able to, you know, win a, a tender for four municipalities instead of one, they might be able to, to do it for a bit better price. But there was there was just more logistics involved with the recycling one because we were all heading to in this case, and Tara in rent to the recycling facility. But we'll continue to consider the group tendering for government moving forward. Second question is the blue box. Have we entertained the thought of being paid to issue the blue box to the new residents? When a new resident has a new house, who does he call to get a box? They'll be calling the town, no doubt. And then we forward them on to the, to the pro. Yeah, moving forward, so the pros will be responsible for that. So they will provide the blue box uh, box itself to the residents. We probably will continue to get calls for quite some time. There will be certainly a, a level of promotion and education that's required. We're, we've had those conversations uh, and continue to have those conversations with the, with CMO as well. Uh, we're expecting some updates from them this month still to uh, provide some information on that getting that promotion education out to the public, but they have requirements under the reg to, to take the lead on that as well. We're just going to work with them and um, provide, you know, provide links on our website and whatnot as best we can, but, but they also have responsibilities to take the lead on that. I just thought it might be a revenue for us to issue the box. Don't mm -hmm. want to be there. Yeah, it's not really an option. <laughs> it's it's the pro's responsibility. You know, there's really no avenue for us to to stay involved. Thank you. Uh, over the next three years, if there's no clear data being collected by the pro, just kind of in that mixed ICI downtown core, would there be any value for us doing our own study, our own data gathering, just so our businesses kind of know what's coming down the pipe for them once 2026 hits? Like, at what point would we consider just doing our own because the pro hasn't done anything? As far as the data collection, yeah, 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 and, and sorry, I failed to mention that it was in the report, um, just not in the slide deck, so I failed to mention it. But that's certainly something that, um, we had included in the staff report that we uh, plan to do in the onset of, of the program over the next year is to reach out and um, survey the ICI business to gather more information as far as what level of interest is involved. The challenge right now is putting out a survey without any financial information, it's hard to survey these businesses. And say, are you interested in being part of the town run uh, ICI program? Well, the first question they're going to say is maybe, but how much, right? So um, they're just not there yet. But we will, that's our intention is to survey the, those businesses to, to garner interest and, and try to iron out and, as far as who's involved, uh, who's contributing to the program right now, or who's uh, part of the program right now, and, and who ultimately would continue to in the future. Um, but to your question, as far as gathering data on sort of what's out there at the curb, like how many boxes in front of this store are the residents versus the business. Yeah, it's something we could we could consider. I'm not sure the logistics on what that looks like. Um, we'll, we'll keep it in mind for sure. I'll take it back and we'll have that discussion uh, just sort of at the staff level and, and sort of ponder ideas of how we can maybe do that without <laughs> investing a whole lot of time and resources. It'd be preferable if they do it, absolutely. Yeah, and I, I, I anticipate that they will do it. It's just not really clear as to how and when and what it might look like, but suspect that they're going to want to do that um, just for their own sake. So, but uh, yeah, I can't commit to it, but certainly take it back and we'll ponder it some more. Maybe we can uh, speak to it in our, in our next update. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. Sorry, just uh, more of a comment, just for the public. I mean, it this all kind of sounds a little bit technic and kind of uh, lots of unknown, but on the good side, when I was looking, I mean, 
people will be able to get rid of their plastic bags that they've been saving up in the garage for uh, multiple years and they can finally recycle them. Uh, so that's something that people have been asking for years, but we haven't been able to provide. So under the new proposed collection, we will be able to get rid of all those plastic bags, which shouldn't be used anyway, but uh, people can get can get rid of them now. Yeah, it's a good yeah a good catch there. It was one of the images uh, in the slide deck as far as what will be included in the, the post transition uh, list of materials. Um, it also lists single use plastics, straws and spoons, and that kind yeah. of thing. Which is, it, to your point, it is kind of an interesting dynamic. And I don't have a lot of knowledge over it specifically to speak to, but you know we have regulations coming out at the federal level, even restricting these products, um, which is great. Um, but then it's also interesting to see that they're they're making efforts to also include it in the recycling stream as well. So kind of approaching it from two different angles, uh, I suppose. But uh, yeah, I think I think ideally you just prefer to see these products sort of eliminated altogether. And I think that's probably a lot of the, the logic in the producing responsibility too, right? Because they're the ones creating the plastic bags at the for the grocery store or whatever the case may be. Uh, so if you put the responsibility on them, which, you know, to, to our knowledge, those types of products are the ones that are more challenging to recycle, more costly to recycle, not as much profit in them, right? So, you know, if they're required to recycle them, maybe they'll just stop making them. And I think that's sort of the idea behind the, the whole producer responsibilities. Yeah, definitely. Yes. Actually, expanding on that a little bit, um, speculation. This library had to be any any true of the following. You know, there's actually pretty significant um, I don't know, 10 or 11 items in there. Do you know, is there intention to expand on the any two of the following to be any five of the following or any six? Is that sort of where this is all heading? Yeah, so sorry. Um, you know the one I mean. Yeah, I knew I didn't speak to it, but the, the two of the following. So we do we do collect more than two of them. I don't want to say exactly, but definitely more than two of them. But a lot of those uh, that were captured in the two of the following in the post transition are just included. I think the, the majority of them, there may have been a couple that, that were not, but yes, in short, yes, there is intention for more of those to be just all required. Yeah, yeah, there's the image there, at least two of these. So you've got everything from aluminum foil, box board, cardboard, polystyrene, box paper. Uh, and then when you move over, it's kind of just an exercise of matching up the images, I guess. But you can see that they've got the box board, um, the cardboard, the polystyrene. Like the vast majority of them are, are pretty much in there. Okay. Okay. That's yeah, not all of them, to be honest with you. So, the exception of textile and clothing. <laughs> so, it's yes. yeah. Thank and you, Kevin. We've got Billy up here too. Billy, any questions at all? On Okay. All right. Thank you. Great, uh, great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No one in favor? Yeah, that was for information. Do we need no one in favor on this? Yeah. All in favor? And uh, the budget user fees and charges. The council passed a bylaw at the February 13th, 2023 council meeting. To implement the proposed changes to the user fees and charges bylaw. Move around seconder, please. Councillor Cooper, Councillor Toner, Jennifer. Review, members of council. So today I'm gonna um, talk about the 2023 user fees and charges review to give a bit of background. So the consolidated user fees and charges bylaw, it's meant to incorporate really all of our user fees and charges in one place. So everything in for all our services and activities in the one bylaw. Um, for this bylaw, we do do a comprehensive annual review. Uh, we do that, we want to make sure that we're meeting anything legislative. We want to make sure, you know, uh, we're meeting our strategic plan sustainability objectives. We want to line it up with our budget. We do it right now with our budget process. We want to remain comparable with um, neighboring or like municipalities um, as well. So uh, the proposed, re proposed revisions to the use of recent charges bylaw, uh, we've included a staff report tonight. Um, and what I've done is we've also attached those draft bylaw schedules. And what we did to make it easier, we just highlighted um, anything in yellow was any of the ones that are going to be revised to help council uh, quickly see where some of those changes um, are happening. Um, so tonight we're looking here to get some feedback from council. Um, 
um, before we bring the user fees and charges by while we're looking to bring it back at the February 13th meeting and pass it along with budget at the same time. So council can digest some of this and give us some feedback um, over the next two. Uh, week or two before we bring back that bylaw on the 13th. So we do have a lot of bylaw schedules. I'm not going to list them all here, but they're kind of um, listed there A to L uh, for all the various different uh, groups of services. Um, and in the presentation today, I'm just going to talk to the really the ones that we're going to have some proposed uh, changes to just to highlight for council what some of those changes are. So um, under Schedule E for planning, um, we have a fee for a bylaw change. There's no change to the fee amount. What we're looking for is we're just adding some wording clarity around this just to confirm that the fee applies to um, bylaw changes other than just encroachments. So for example, if someone wanted to sign a bylaw um, exemption change, that would also trigger the bylaw change fee as well. So let's just put in clarification wording in it. Moving to waste management, uh, as, as John uh, just uh, spoke a lot about here. Um, so from the annual budget presentation that we provided, um, uh, the first meeting in January, uh, we did propose that reduction of the annual garbage and recycling fee from 170 down to 150. Um, and that was obviously due to the best change in producer pay partway through the year. And as, as we've already, John mentioned here, we may have to eventually develop a separate ICI rate in the future uh, if need be. Uh, Schedule G, water and wastewater. Um, so uh, we do have an increase on the base rates and a two percent increase, or sorry, a two cent increase on consumption rates for an approximate five percent increase for the average residential user. Um, what we did is we adjusted the bulk water rates as well because it's a multiplier of the consumption rate. So if that increases, well, then we multiply the single by the bulk water rates adjustment. So you'll see that come through as well. Um, and here there's a different implementation time frame though. We do implement the water waste rates to come into effect on March uh, 1st, 2023. Um, that's so we get through the first uh, biannual, or the first bi-monthly, sorry, uh, uh, water billing, then the new rates are proposing off to the next set. Um, moving on to cemeteries. Um, so we do have for our plot uh, a niche sales and internment fees. We did include um, a three-year schedule, so 2023 to 2025 which includes a 2% annual adjustment per year. And this is to help offset the maintenance costs for the cemeteries. Um, another change you'll see in the schedules is for niches. We did add um, a level E uh, onto our niche level fees. And what that is is because the Mel Road Columbaria that we have being installed uh, this year is actually gonna be five rows high. So we will have a fifth row that um, required uh, fees attached to it. So we'll see that in the schedule. Um, under Schedule K for her, the recreation facilities and programs, um, just speaking in general um, for recreation costs, uh, we do have overall facility management recreation program costs are increasing. We do want to make sure that we keep up on user fees for that to keep it up proportionately. Um, and it's really interesting when you think of the user fees we charge versus the levy, it's actually part of our strategic plan vision. Part of the vision actually says to have a sustainable financial model that actually balances that tax and non-tax revenues. So we just want to make sure that we're always keeping up with that proportion of user fees versus levy-based. And, and uh, these small incremental increases on the REC programming is one way to keep up with those percentages. So for proposed revisions, we do have... Um, a 3% increase uh, across for ice rentals. Um, same thing, a different implementation date for this. This would come into effect April 1st, 2023. And this is so that all the current winter contracts that we've already issued out in place for all of the, um, all of the user groups, I, they kind of come to an end and then this new rate would come into effect for the remaining portion of the year. Uh, we did add some clarifying wording for tournaments, um, just so that it clarifies that the tournament rate you get for a day that it covers uh, only twelve hours of ice, uh, covers twelve hours of ice. Um, also, we included a new line for public skating. If you bring an infant with you, zero to two, there'd just be no charge uh, for an infant. Uh, so that's a new line in the on the bylaw. Um, we've consolidated our swimming for hourly rentals. Uh, you'll see um, some changes we made there. It just really simplifies it. We've changed it to just have the resident, the non-resident, and the swim club and school rates. It made it a much simpler uh, portion of the bylaw than having all these individual uh, hourly charges for, for larger uh, lines there. So you'll see how that kind of consolidates and simplifies the process there. Um, you'll also see in the bylaw, we just added a, um, a seasonal locker rental fee for swim club members. It just allows um, those ones who are there constantly to be able to just have a, a locker fee uh, for the season instead of having to pay a daily locker fee. 
Um, continuing on with some proposed revisions, um, we've adjusted, once again, no fee change, but we've adjusted the swim title lessons here um, for the new uh, descriptions under the Life Saving Society. So what that does is it um, they move to a new program there where they describe the programs differently. So you'll see all those changes to all the SWIM programs um, being updated for that. And we've removed all of the different uh, levels of the multiple registration discounts. So now it all comes in, whenever someone now registers online with Perfect Mind, it all lines up with how the program works to register for your, for your programs. Um, they've also adjusted the aquifit rates. Um, there used to be a session there for 30 classes and that was uh, quite, 30 classes a lot to commit to. They found that a lot of people wanted to kind of, you know, commit more about for those 10 week sessions. So you can see that we've adjusted the aquifit uh, rates and we've put them in now for these 10 week sessions. Uh, we did a small increase to the public uh, swimming rates at an increase of uh, 25 cents for each of the different categories of age. Um, we've also uh, made an adjustment to the swim memberships. Um, what we've done is we found that over the last couple of years is that the, we see that the swim memberships aren't being purchased. These are those um, big, huge, large ones for your whole year um, of a swim membership. Um, so instead, we've added public swim or lane swim punch cards. People seem to want like that better where they're not committing once again to that large dollar value for a full year. But you can purchase um, a swim card, a punch card, so they have a bit of a discount on that and come in and use the, your uh, punch card up. So that's been introduced into the fees as well. Um, we've also just adjusted the non-resident gazebo rental rate just to reflect um, the non-resident markup, uh, same percentage that's included on and everything else. And we did a small uh, inflationary adjustment to the ball line rental rates as well. Moving on to the museum and culture schedule. Uh, we well, one renamed the schedule to museum and culture. Um, and then we added a clarifying um, section in here as well. So very similar to the recreation programming. Uh, we put some wording in here that says due to the varying nature of programs under the museum of culture that we're going to be starting to be offering, uh, we're just going to allow the fees for those program offerings to be set throughout the year. Um, and that will be done in consultation with the manager uh, culture curator in consultation with myself. And we'll make sure that it's based on the annual council approved operating budget. So this is so that, you know, if they develop, you know, partway through the year a children's program, they can decide what they're going to have to charge for that March break camp or the spring, um, uh, cultural program for having a two-day program or something like that to set the individual rates for those uh, various programs. Um, so for financial considerations, um, the proposed amendments to the user fees and charges, um, we did review it and through the annual budget processing and those impacts are, were included in the 2023 draft budget that was presented to the council. So next steps, as I mentioned at the start, um, we're looking to obtain it. any council feedback has on any of those fees. We'll take all that feedback and we can come and bring it back to council, like I said, at the February 13th uh, meeting of council for your consideration. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, Jennifer, there's on the punch cards for swimming, there's no non resident ones. I'm going to help Brad help me out with that one. So you started to look at the um, at the rates. You would then be charging more for a punch card if you went with like so. Our, our non-resident rate was a fifty percent markup. <clears throat> so then it would they they would just never use it. <clears throat> but you have no benefits, and then they would always just pay the the drop in fee for swimming because then your price point on that punch card would make it fifty percent more than just like that single drop. But essentially, what you're doing with the punch card is you're you're paying for nine swims and you're, you're getting 10. Okay, but we have, so I'm trying to wrap my head around this. We have a non-resident public swim admission, right? Correct. No, sorry, for drop-ins we don't. So they're all they're all just flat rates. So if you're an adult, based on what's proposed in the in the in the updated user fees and charges bylaw, you would be now paying 450 to drop in, whether you're from Armfryer, you're from Ottawa, wherever you're wherever you're from. So why do we not have a non-resident fee for drop-in swimming? Uh well, a couple of reasons. One, it's it's relatively uncommon for most pools that that have drop-in swims. Number two, it's just a matter of of policing that. Um that that's a bit more of a challenge. So every time you come to the counter, now I need to see. Right. A driver's license or something that would provide proof of residency to determine what rate I'm going to to charge you when you come in. 
Right. It's unfortunate. Okay. Thank you. Never fun to increase user fees, but I'm taking a look, for example, at the comparators, and I mean, we're still competitive in terms of our rates. We're sitting at two of the five comparable level, two or number one in most cases. So, um, thank you. All in favor on that one? I said, we'll order. Oh, sorry. Um, Grant, the Tooney swims that are on right now, mm -hmm. they're not captured in here at all. Would that be something ongoing or? Uh, basically, kind of the way that was working is um, we were having the amount of time they were in the pool. It was just because we had a, a instead of having an hour of pool time, they were just basically in there for half an hour. Okay. So okay. we were essentially kind of just dividing what that value of the pool time, what the the, the bylaw would charge you for a full rate, just kind of cutting right. that in half. And that's kind of what we were we were doing for that, just to kind of optimize the, the pool time and not just having to sit in empty for a half hour period. Okay. That's and I have one quick question for Jennifer as well. Um, that just in the merchandise one, we've got cost plus 5%. Are there any plans to ever have our merch um, available to local businesses? I just, uh, I know that we're just looking at cost recovery basically on that, but we'd be undercutting local businesses if we were selling it at that. Is there any plans to offer stuff that the town isn't selling, branded merchandise to local businesses to sell where they can make, you know, 20 points on it if they want to? Um, I'll take the comment away to the marketing okay. answer, and I'll be sure I get that. That's great. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Billy has a question. Oh, <laughs> I have a question, uh, I guess, for Graham and or Jennifer. So one of the recommendations was the elimination of the volume discounts, along with the membership changes to the 10 punch swim card. Um, is Was there a lot of usage of those two or... Um, you know, like, is this change going to affect a lot of people? Uh, uh, the, the usage has not been high on, on either of those options, which uh, prompted changes in the past. So when it comes to kind of that, that group discount that we had with swimming, there used to be like a, a family swim membership. Um, and it was it was quite cost prohibitive. Um, one, you'd need a family of at least four and very active in the pool for it to be even worth your while. Number two, you'd have to be able to afford that. So we thought, all right, we're going to eliminate that and we'll still make it attractive to families by saying, well, here's kind of a group discount. We haven't had any uptake on that. Uh, further to which it would be, it's very challenging to apply it in our online registration system. So it really, in theory, would only work if you were re registering multiple children within the same course that you could then say, oh, this gets, discount would apply as opposed to, adding multiple things from different areas. Um, and as we even saw more recently with the swimming registration, it's it's enough of a challenge to get three kids in at the same time, just with how quickly those spaces are going. So it just, it, it hasn't been used whatsoever. Um, in fairness to any of the, the public that may want to use it, I mean, COVID kind of uh, put a lot of restrictions on, on interest in having these sorts of memberships or volume discounts. And we've also had um you know not this year but in, in the past couple of years we've also had capacity restrictions as well uh, to follow the guidelines in place so that's the other thing that we were considering when we were looking at these memberships when you look at um other recreation departments that might have you know six month or, or year-long memberships you have to be able to make sure that you can provide the the complete benefit of that membership meaning yes i can get into this program whenever i want to um, right now with what we're seeing in, in, with our pool numbers, there's, there's no guarantee that you're going to, that you're going to get in. Um, the only way to increase that capacity is to have increased staffing. And, and we know in the aquatics uh, world right now, that's, that's also, uh, become a challenge as well. So there's a lot of factors that have kind of played into this. Um, the last thing I will say on, on the punch card, there hasn't been a punch card for, lane swims and, and rec swims or public swims, if you prefer. We have had one uh, with Aquafit and that one was very popular uh, pre-COVID. We kind of had to take it aside during COVID because we needed everyone to pre-register um, in advance. We've now reintroduced that. We're seeing the interest in that pick up and we're hoping we'll see a similar thing when it comes to the lane and public swims as well um, with the introduction of this card. Thanks, Graham. 
on the learners report. Zoning bylaw amendments. The council receives an application for an amendment to zoning bylaw number 6875-18 for a vacant property along Sheffield Street to rezone the subject property from residential two with golden symbol H1 to residential two with section 43 with golden symbol H1. And that pursuant to section 3412 of the Planning Act, Council holds a public meeting on Monday, February 27, 2023, regarding the proposed amendment to allow for public review and comment. Okay. Right. So this zoning amendment bylaw amendment application is for vacant lands along Sheffield Street across from Melbourne Road as per the key plan seen on the screen. The address of the subject property will be 24 Sheffield Road. So the applicants are seeking the amendment to permit the development of a four-story, 37-unit condominium development with a rooftop terrace. The development will include a one one-bedroom unit and 36 two-bedroom units, uh, as well as 46 parking spaces. The site plan was submitted in support of the application. You can see one of the plans that they submitted on the screen. These are some renderings that were submitted by the applicant. The proposed building would have a main roof height of 13.13 meters and a rooftop patio stairwell is proposed that would reach a height of 16.73 meters. The rooftop terrace is proposed to include a pergola, seating area, gas fireplace, and a barbecue. Next So in the official plan, the subject property is designated mixed use commercial employment area subject to section C5.8.4. Um, and that subsection permits medium and high density residential uses up to six stories subject to the consideration of zoning bylaw amendment. The current zoning of the property is residential two with holding single H1, which permits apartment and multiple unit dwellings with a maximum height of 10.5 meters. The proposed amendments are to permit an increase in the maximum height from 10.5 meters to 17 meters and increase the balcony encroachment into the front yard setback from 1.5 meters to 1.7 meters. The maximum height proposed, 17 meters, is only at the location of the rooftop terrace to accommodate the stairway access and other features such as the pergola. The rooftop terrace is set back a minimum of 2.75 meters from the edge of the flat roof. So following a decision by council to hold a public meeting, notice of the complete application and public meeting will be circulated um, to hold the public meeting on Monday, February 27th. 20 days notice of the public meeting will be provided by mailing a notice to all landowners within 120 meters of the subject property and placing signage on the property. A courtesy notice will also be posted in the local news. After the public meeting, a staff report will be brought forward to council and will include options for consideration, including passage of the amending bylaw, proposed changes up to the bylaw, or refusing the amending bylaw. So that's just a really brief overview of the application. Mr. Lynch. Thank you. <clears throat> first, uh, welcome, Eric, to uh, council for your first crack at this thing. The second thing where it says 17 meters in height. Has our fire department been talking for Tom? Who's not here? He's our ex fire chief to say it's up. Does our fire capability uh, be okay with that height? So the application for zoning pilot amendment was circulated to uh, Nick Desarnian. Um, I haven't received comments back from the application yet, um, but that can be something that we ensure we receive in time for. Public meeting and for bringing the report back. Thank you. Yes, the proposal looks very interesting, and I just wanted to ensure. So these are condominiums, so people will be purchasing the, purchasing these uh, units, uh, not renting them, correct? Uh -huh. That's the understanding we've been given by the help. Yeah. Good. Okay. Thank you. All in favor? 
Recommendation to address the impact of no one holding on. The council received staff report 23-01-23-04 as information regarding Bill 109, the More Homes for Everyone Act 2022, and Bill 23, the More Homes Bill Faster Act 2022. And further, the council directs staff to proceed with drafting an official plan amendment to specify the plans and documents that may be required for complete zoning bylaw amendment or site plan application, require pre consultation review, which may require peer review. Technical sign out for acceptance and to include wording that recognizes the ability of the municipality to approve a site plan with conditions. Director Cooper, Council Grinstead, Alex, you're up again. All right. So, Bill 109, the More Homes for Everyone Act of 2022, was the province's first step in implementing the Ontario Housing Affordability Task Force report recommendation. Uh, Bill 109 amended four pieces of legislation, including the Planning Act, the Development Charges Act, the New Home Construction Licensing Act, and the Ontario New Home Warranties Plan Act. So the main objectives of the bill are to increase housing supply, address market speculation, and protect home buyers, owners, and renters. Um, so the report includes a brief description of all of the changes to the various acts under Bill 109 and the potential impacts um, and staff recommendations. In my presentation, I'm just going to highlight the amendment under Bill 109 where action is recommended for the timeline. Okay. So, Bill 109 amended timelines for zoning bylaw amendments and now requires refunds where timelines are not met. Um, the timeline for making a decision on a zoning bylaw amendment and for providing a refund when a decision is not made within that prescribed timeline is detailed in the table um, and in your report. So. If we make a decision within 120 days of deeming the application complete, um, if it's accompanied by official plan amendment, we don't need to apply a refund. But it's just a zoning bylaw amendment application, we would have 90 days before we have to start issuing refunds. And they get progressively longer, but larger the longer the decision takes to be made. So the legislative timeline does not have a stop the clock mechanism. So when applicants are required to respond to comments or requirements to submit a revised report, plan, or study, if we deemed the application complete, that clock case ticking. So that can really eat into that 90 day. Um, so the requirement for refunds was set to take effect January 1st, 2023. However, municipalities received a letter from Steve Clark indicating the effective date of the fee refund is going to be revised to July 1st, 2023. So this just gives us a few extra months. To put some changes into place. So, staff recommends that an official plan amendment further detail what may be required for a complete zoning bylaw amendment application, including completion of required pre consultation. So, the timeline for zoning bylaw amendment decisions are generally met. Um, staff recommends that an official plan amendment include that an application for zoning bylaw amendment will require a stage one and may require stage two pre consultation. So stage one pre-consultation would determine and identify issues and policies affecting the proposed application and identify what information or material is required for the application to be considered complete. Um, as pre-consultation stage two may require peer review technical sign up for acceptance of studies or plans prior to the application being deemed complete. So this means that there's eliminating some of that potential for back and forth there, there's no stop the clock mechanism. Um, this will allow for the timeline for decision to begin only after any revised plan studies or reports are submitted and have been determined to provide the information required for staff to prepare recommendations. So this is a consistent with the approach that's being proposed by the County of Renfrew through County Official Plan Amendment Number 35. Um, and it's also councils should be kind of aware of these timelines when deferral decision on zoning bylaw amendment applications will be considered. So to sum up, at the county, uh, someone wants to come in and build a house or do something to their property. They arrive at the counter and the person gives them a list of things to do. Once he's done that list of things to do, then he comes back, submitted it, the clock starts. 
It doesn't start when you start the application. When you start doing information, if you're asking questions to build a new house, it doesn't start when I ask the question. Correct. When I get the application in my hand at the county, that's when it starts. Yeah. And so, so a lot of property owners are fearful if there's too many things they have to do, environmental check, that, 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 that it's all on a list of what you have to do for that one piece of property or your condo or whatever you're going to do. Yeah, so that would be the stage one pre-consultation. So the stage one pre-consultation, it, it can often be as simple as at the desk or um, in a one-on-one -on -one meeting with the planning staff. Somebody needs a zoning bylaw amendment and the planning staff will identify what's required for your application for zoning bylaw amendment to be considered complete. Um, if your zoning bylaw amendment application, for example, requires a number of studies, the introduction of the stage two pre-consultation means that we wouldn't even just accept those studies if you walk in and say, here's my zoning bylaw amendment application and my traffic impact study. Um, adding into an official plan amendment the ability to require a stage two pre-consultation meeting is we can say, okay, Thank you for what you submitted, but we're going to look over the traffic impact study and make sure it addresses all of the questions we were looking for to address before we deem the application complete and start the clock. Thank you. Done. Oh, she has more. She has more. <laughs> That's okay. Um, so for site plan approval, there's also been some changes to the site plan approval um, provisions under the Planning Act. So the amendments identify that a municipality may require specific information or plans for a site plan application to be considered complete. But we can only do that if the official plan contains provisions relating to requirements for complete site plan applications, detailing what may be required. So that's part of the recommendation for the official plan amendment is to detail what may be required for a site plan application um, in greater detail so we make sure we can ask for all of the studies that are needed to make an informed decision. Um, and staff now have 30 days to determine and advise if site plan application is complete and the applicant can appeal this decision or if no decision is made within that 30 days. Um, the new subsection 41 11.1 provides rules respecting when municipalities are required to refund fees in respect of site plan control applications, as shown in the tables. So, basically, in order to not have to issue a refund, a decision on a site plan application needs to be made within 60 days. Um, and this is a fairly short timeline and one that the town of Arnpire um, does not need as often, like zone bylaw amendments, we usually need that time, yeah, day timeline. Um, site plans are more challenging because there's a lot more back and forth. So we'll receive a package for a site plan application, we'll provide comments to the applicant, and they'll come back with revised plans and studies. Um, but similar to zoning bylaw amendments, there's no stop to clock function on that 60 days. So once they've submitted and we've deemed the application complete, that 60 days starts. Um, so again, it was set to take effect January 1st, 2023, um, but it's been, we've been given indications that that's going to be revised to July 1st, 2023. So staff are recommending that an official plan amendment detail what may be required for complete site plan application, including completion of required pre-consultations, and that includes potentially um, the stage one and stage two pre-consultations. So again, we can pre-review studies like a traffic impact study or stormwater management study before we deem the application complete. Um, this is consistent with the approach proposed by the County of Renfrew and include wording that recognize the ability of the municipality to approve site plans with conditions. Um, the wording in the official plan is not required to allow conditional approval on site plans, including this in the official plan will clarify the municipal approach on site plan approval to the condition. So just to let you know, a separate report at an upcoming council meeting will consider the impact of Bill 22. And this is just the report recommendation. So wrapping my head around this, my understanding from what you just said is that currently the way we 
proceed with applications or not generally meeting the, the timelines. For site plans. Right. But now that you know what's needed, I think it's, am I right in thinking that it actually means more work on you to make sure that all of the things that we need to make those decisions faster come in before you deem it the application acceptable. Does that make sense? Am I, am I? We're shifting some right. of that uh, review to before we do an application complete. So we're already doing that review to determine if the studies have the information we need to make an informed decision. Um, we're just shifting that from the like decision period right. um, to before in determining if the application is complete. Okay, so that's what I'm thinking. So when when different applications come in and we do these public meetings and we just des we decide that we need traffic, we need a noise study, we need this, we need that, you're going to determine all of that first so that when we do these public meetings or decision makings that we have all of that information ahead of time. That's the goal. Okay. Um, so the, that pre-consultation doesn't happen kind of in isolation. So what we do for applications, for example, site plans, um, when site plans come in, we reach out to our operations team, we reach out to the county planning department, we reach out to the county um, public works department, our building department, as well as other departments that maybe have comments. Um, and we do that pre-consultation at stage one to determine what's required with those parties involved. So that if the county wants a traffic impact study, they can let the applicant and, and we as the planner know right up front so that they know that that's going to be the application. Okay, and we'll get all of that before you deem the application ready to go. <clears throat> so we should be able to meet the guidelines then. If we're receiving all of those studies and they're being reviewed to ensure they have all the necessary information, um, yes, we believe so. The onus is on you and the department to more. Yes, okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Just a comment, CAO, somewhere I read that the site plans are now the approval of the CAO. Correct? Right? So right. once this is done, it doesn't come back to council. Right. That's already the case currently. Thank you. Uh, to okay. Councilor Grinsett's point about it being extra work beforehand for the pre consultation, are there any fees attached to the pre consultation period that we're capturing um, when they enter that stage one or stage two? So, currently for the stage one pre consultation, no, there are no fees. Um, we treat that as an information meeting. Sometimes applicants are just trying to scope out whether this project is feasible, so they may be given a list of studies and realize this isn't the right project for them at this time. Um, and then the stage two pre-consultation, like right now, that type of review work, um, particularly the engineering review, for example, we do that on a cost recovery basis. Okay. Um, so I, I believe the intention would be to continue to do a lot of cost recovery basis. Okay. And given that it may be more work, will this affect our application fees once they enter the application fee? Part or will they stay relatively static even though we have this extra staff? Uh, our intention was to keep them static. Okay. The process, process is still the process that we have to go through, and the time should be um, just mm -hmm. the same as what it was. Could have been taking it just, later on. Yeah, it really is, uh, as uh, Alex indicated, is a shift from you know, when, when do we deem it complete, either okay. before we've done that review or after. So. Um, you know, we know that the, the county has had their public meeting with respect to their amendment to their official plan to, to incorporate this, and there's been some concerns from developers that um, that are suggesting, you know, all you've done is shift the responsibility and really have an the time frames that the province is trying to get us to, not to, to pre uh, presuppose what kind of comments you might get, but those are the kinds of things that we're hearing, and, uh, and the county has certainly heard, uh, but the reality is that it's the only way we can do it that that allows us to be able to look realistically new time frames that the province is putting on us in the summer to, to struggle with the uh, financial penalties to, to do that. So it's uh, certainly a step that we've seen other municipalities take to ensure that they're uh, not put in a position where we can't keep new timelines and try to be fair about the process. Okay, yeah, that was my next question. It's going to be how common is this in other municipalities? Because uh, will this 
be the, to the detriment of our part, we have this extra step. But if everyone's doing this, it's a level playing field pretty much. You certainly have met with the other um, uh, planners within the county as well as the county planning department, and uh, I'm still come to the same conclusion that this makes the most sense for all of us. So not my understanding of making this project should fall on the same data. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Thanks. To give you some context as well, so I used to work within a different county um at that county they were already requiring for example hydrogeological studies for lot creation on private services those had to be peer reviewed and accepted before they would accept the application so that's something they were already doing last year oh wow um so it is not an unheard of process okay so just simply put for you know anybody watching or whatever if nothing that they weren't expected to do to start with, it's just flipping it in front, front loading the information as opposed to backhanding it. Correct? Yeah. 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 So we've always held pre consultation meetings to make sure the developers are understanding what the requirements are. Yeah. And it is a requirement already, but it just takes that extra step. Yeah. Just, just one note. Like, and I think, you know, with the, with the set, deadlines that the province have like that they've um like they've imposed with the penalties i think it's what it's kind of doing it's it's, it's making the developers and the municipalities just become more more efficient and making sure that they have everything um set to go mm -hmm. uh and that we're ready to receive it with the answer so uh, i don't think there was never uh, a deadline on these uh proposals before but now that it's being measured you know the developers become better prepared and will be better prepared to uh, give them good service so that's how I see it myself yeah yeah I think it definitely incentivizes municipalities to meet these timelines some of these timelines already were within the planning act but there were no penalties for not meeting them other than that the applicant could appeal to the Ontario Land Tribunal um, but unfortunately, because of the, there's no corresponding penalty to the applicant. Um, so it means that, for example, if, without the stop the clock function, if we were still using the back and forth process between the application complete and then we would provide comments and expect a response. Um, if their consultant, for whatever reason, couldn't meet the 60 day timeline, um, we could be in a position where we issue comments in a timely manner, but we still are subject to issuing a refund or refusing the application. So just saying, okay, well, you haven't addressed the comments within the 60 days. So we're turning down the application and requiring you to reapply. Um, and that obviously cost additional fees for the developer um, and isn't serving the purpose of advancing the applications. All in favor? Thank you. Okay, and we have a proclamation. Okay, Council complaint February 13th, 2023 is where we're at Canada Day in the town of Barnfar. We were in a second, please. Mr. Cooper, Councilor Grinstead. And um, so, whereas heart disease is the number one killer of women worldwide and the leading cause of premature death for Canadian women, a fact unknown to many women and their health care providers, and whereas globally cardiovascular disease is in fact one out of three women, yet women everywhere are understudied, underdiagnosed, undertreated, and underaware when it comes to their cardiovascular, cardiovascular health, and whereas the Canadian Women's Health Heart Health Alliance is an organization of volunteer health professionals and patients working hard to improve women's heart health, and whereas Wear Red Canada Day is celebrated annually to raise awareness for all Canadians, but especially Canadian women, to be mindful, curious, and proactive in the management of their heart health and wellness, and whereas we want to see better prevention, diagnosis, care, and fewer women dying prematurely from heart disease. Therefore, the town of Barcar does hereby proclaim February 13th, 2023 is where Red Canada Day in the town of our park. Okay, and all in favor. I believe that's a council 
on the day. Is that not? Is there it is. Yeah. Okay, so we'll all be dressed in our, our red finest for the council by day. <laughs> and we have another proclamation for us. The council proclaimed February 2023 as Black History Month in the town of Bar Park. Thank you, Brenda Stephanie, please. And Councilor Lynch, Councilor Toner. Whereas the government of Canada is celebrating Black History Month in February, and whereas the province of Ontario and government of Canada also recognize Black History Month and its significance in February, and whereas the town of Arnpar understands the importance of recognizing individuals in Arnpar, both past and present, for members of the Black community, and whereas during Black History Month, we commemorate and celebrate the many achievements and contributions made by Black Canadians, who throughout our history have shaped our country's heritage and identity, and whereas through the month of February, the town of Arthur will share various information and resources pertaining to Black History Month via social media and the town's website. Therefore, the town of Arthur does hereby proclaim February 2023 as Black History Month in the town of Arthur and encourages all residents, staff, and members of council to take the time to participate and utilize shared resources and other information to learn more and understand how these communities continue to help shape the story of Canada. All in favor. Okay, we have no committee reports or minutes. Uh, motions. Council Councilor Greenwood and for Council Councilor. Thank you, Mayor. The Ontario Winter Games are coming to town. The reunion event will take place the 2nd to the 5th of February at the next Smith Center with uh, Washu. Event taking the place February 10, 11 at the Armpire District High School. Another name for Washu is Kung Fu or Martial Arts Competition. Of note, all games are free admission. The last week, uh, County, we met to discuss our draft four year strategic plan. The final draft will be part of our 2023 budget deliberations. And at the 23 Roma Conference being held today and uh, tomorrow and Wednesday, the county was successful in obtaining five delegations to meet with the Ministry of Children, Community and Social Services, Ministry of Housing, Ministry of Agriculture, Foods and Rural Affairs, Ministry of Health, and lastly, the Minister Ministry of Infrastructure. And we have uh, Councillor Dino in Toronto attending uh, this Roma meeting, so he'll have all kinds of information, I'm sure, when he comes back. Thank you. Um, item 15, correspondence and petitions. With the correspondence package, the number I-23-January-02 be received with information and filed accordingly. Okay, move for a seconder, please. Councillor Grinstead, Councillor Cooper. And all in favor? No. Oh, no, you've got coffee. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. Page 19, there is a seniors community grants available. Applications must be made between January 11 and March 6. This grant is to support the delivery of programs and learning opportunities for seniors. Applications will be accepted through the Transfer Payment Ontario site. To the CEO, can this grant be incorporated into some of the town departments, i.e. Recreation Museum and Prime or Brime? Uh, the staff um, are absolutely looking at this grant. I think there's an opportunity in the recreation department that might uh, cross boundaries. So we're excited to uh, about the possibility of that. And we're going to come from that. Thank you. On page 19, AMO is offering a barrier free web solution through THD Digital for a webinar on January 26 at noon to see GovStack, the newest content management system for your municipal website. To the CEO, have we anyone scheduled to attend this webinar? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Our economic development uh, marketing officer will be attending it. We are with um, JHD for our website now, so um, we'll see if uh, GovStack is anything uh, in addition to what we already received from them. Thank you. On page 19, again, the LAS fuel program is now part of Canoe. Cut the cost of running your police by buying fuels and lubricants in bulk or from your local gas station. Contact the fuel rep to get started with a fuel correction free fuel assessment to the CAO. With this fuel program now part of LAS, is it worthwhile to take advantage of this free fuel assessment? Um, we're always looking at us and, and the few uh, opportunities that are available to municipalities, and we'll certainly consider this as well. Thank you. And lastly, page 22 for our public works is the LAS road and sidewalk assessment service is getting ready for the 2023 surveys. 
season. Better data helps you get to the most of your maintenance dollar. Contact Tanner for a free quote for your 2023 scan. To the CEO, have we considered contacting LAS for this free quote? Uh, we have, and we've, we're in discussions with us about a quote. Great, thank you. Thank you, Mayor. All in favor, on our carried. Uh, and correspondence package next one. So the correspondence package number A 23 January 02 be received and that the recommendations outlined be brought forward for council's consideration. And a uh, mover in the seconder, please. Okay, Councillor Lynch, Council Cooper. Comments? Good. Carried. All in favor? Uh, Bylaws and resolutions. That the following bylaw be and it is hereby enacted and passed. Bylaw number 7350 23, adopt the 2023 non union solid good. Mover and a seconder, please. Councillor Princeton, Councillor Tonger. All in favor? You're opposed? Carry. And resolutions. Whereas the County of Brentford is hosting the Ontario Winter Games with the Ringette event, event taking place February 2nd, 5th, 2023 at the Nixon Centre, and the Wushu event taking place February 10th to 11th, 2023 at Armpar District High School, and whereas the Ontario Winter Games Organizing Committee <coughs> presented to Council of the Town of Armpar at the December 7th, 2022 Special Meeting of Council and requested approximately $10,000 of in-kind support including use of the Nick Smith Center Arena and Community Hall for the ring out event and other incidental support subject to operational availability. Therefore, be it resolved that Council of the Corporation of the Town of Armbar authorize up to $10,000 of in-kind support for the facility use and incidental support for the 2023 Ontario Winter Games. Mover and the seconder on that one, please. County Councilor Lynch and mm -hmm. Councilor Cooper. And all in favor? Okay, now opposed, carried. Announcements. Couple, Mayor. The Empire Regional Health Foundation is holding a masquerade fundraising party Saturday, 28 January at the Nick Smith Center. All proceeds from this event goes toward the medical equipment for the Empire Hospital. I think it's now closed. You can't buy any tickets Today anymore. Today, yes. Uh, and the good news is the second fun euchre tournament, the Knights and Legion, is this Friday at the Parish Hall. We managed to survive the storm last time. Registration at 6.30, cost $10 per team. And lastly, on behalf of the community, thanks to the Armbar Optimus Club for the Super Winter Carnival that was enjoyed by people of all ages. Thank you. Uh, uh, the Armpire Curling Club is recognizing Armpire resident and accomplished curler Isabel Monroe, as well as celebrating her 98th birthday with the Isabel Monroe Mixed Bonds Bill on March 4th. The cost is $260 a team. You get two 8 end matches, breakfast, lunch, and a roast beef dinner. Uh, it's a buffet dinner, dancing, and a chance to win cash and prizes. If you're interested, Sarah Tate from the uh, Curling Club is handling that. You can text her at... 613-266-8248. Um, just a little bit about Isabel Monroe. Uh, Metroland Media says she is a bona fide legend in our prior and well beyond. She's been part of the Curling Club for 70 years <laughs> and has proudly represented our prior and is one of the best curlers to come out of the Ottawa Valley. Uh, she skipped for local teams to six provincial finals, 1-1. And she's been to the national finals and won a bronze medal there back in the 70s. Okay. Uh, just a reminder to have when the pet licenses are still free in January or February. If you get that after February, it jumps up to 25 bucks and 50 bucks if you haven't neutered your pet, and it doubles after March. So get it for free. If you come into town hall, you save yourself the five dollar shipping free. And I'm told that Oliver Jacobs at the desk will tell you a funny joke. I've told I've, I've heard that. <laughs> Um, so it's worth coming in to see if it's true. Uh, just a reminder that <laughs> there is a town bylaw for off-leash pets. It's really a big discussion right now. At-large animals means your dog or cat is off the property uh, without permission of the property owner and not under control of a competent person. 
it is the law. I am a pet owner. I get it. It's uh, it, it's not very many places for your for your pet to go, but private property. Um, if you don't have permission of the landowner to have your pet off leash, you can't do it. It's uh, too risky. Also, there is an online building permit portal that the town has proudly launched. Uh, you can check it out. Local residents and contractors can apply for permits, check the status of your application, request inspections, and pay for building permit fees. Uh, moving that online is great. You can still do it in person. There is an online building portal for it. And also this Friday, if you are tuning in between the ages of 9 and 13, first, good for you for having an interest in local politics. Uh, but second, there is a youth night. It is a tween dance, January 27th from 6.30 to 9. DJ West Snub will be dancing the night away. Um, friends and snack and treats will be available in the community hall. If you buy your tickets online in advance, it's $15 or $20 at the door. And you can find out more on Arm Power Life Facebook page. And that's it. Terrific. Great reminders, Chris. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just a reminder to everybody listening and across the country that January 25th is Bell Let's Talk Day. This is a year-round initiative focused on engaging Canadians to take action to create positive change in mental health. Bell Let's Talk promotes awareness, acceptance, and actions with a strategy built on these four key pillars, anti-stigma, care and access, research, and workplace leadership. Please check the website at letstalk.bell.ca for more information on how we can all create positive change in mental health. Thank you. Thanks, Marilyn. I just wanted to mention that for all the students out there, the town of Armpar offers a really great uh, um, summer student opportunities. I just wanted to let all the students know that our um, our posting our job posting for the summer student positions is now open. So anyone out there who's looking to uh, have some work this summer, if they want to uh, go on our website or our, on our Facebook pages, they can um, get an online application that they can put their resume in and be considered for a summer student employment opportunity. Any questions from media? No. We have no closed session. We're on at the permitory bylaw, please. The bylaw number 7351-23 being a bylaw to confirm the proceedings of the regular meeting of council held on January 23rd, 2023, being is hereby enacted. I have a mover and a seconder, please. And Councilor Lynch, Councilor Cooper, and all in favor, carried. Adjournments. This meeting be adjourned. <laughs> in favor. Over in a seconder. Okay. Councilor Grinstead, and Councilor Lynch, and we'll be able to get. Yeah, really good. And that's an